All right, everybody, it's about time for us to get started tonight. I have a couple of announcements I was supposed to mention, so I'll do that real quick, and then we'll get started with class. Um, three things. One is there's a sign-up sheet for the ladies looking to sign up for Secret Sisters in the foyer on the table. Um, yeah, in the foyer on the table. That's for the Christmas gift exchange for the ladies. So if you want to sign up for that, the sign-up sheet is up there. I'm holding in my hand the sign-up sheet for the men's breakfast. If you are coming, uh, and Alex is not here, so I'm not sure if this is for if you're coming and bringing food or just if you're coming, but just if you're coming. I heard the muffled voice of Alex. I thought I heard somewhere, but I don't know where he came from. Uh, if you're coming, sign up here. I'll put it here, but then I'll put it back there when I'm done tonight. Um, and then finally, this says, we are in need of six dollies to help with the loading of food boxes for the Christmas Brings Hope uh, that we're doing over here in the Fellowship Hall. If you have um, a dolly to loan to uh, to us to use, let Nathan Reinhardt know uh, as soon as possible. Nathan is here, so you can see him after class. Do you have anything to add to that? It needs to have rubber wheels. What other kind of wheels would they have, Nathan? Okay, do not bring a dolly with metal wheels. You will be sent home with a letter. Make sure your your wheels are rubberized. All right. All right, so here's the thing. I've got this thing that I thought would be, I thought it would end up gum, and it's not turning into gum. It's just this hard little ball. So I'm just going to have to be chewing on it for a minute because I can't walk all the way down there because there's no trash can. Actually, you know what? Excuse me. Blah. There, that was discreet. Oh, thank you, wife. All right. Just like a mother. <clears throat> All right, we are in Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5. It's been a few weeks. Had, of course, the Thanksgiving singing last week. Uh, so it's been two weeks since we last had class. We finished two weeks ago, chapter 4, uh, which gave us kind of the, the beginning of what really is the meat of the book of Revelation, chapters 1, 2, and 3 is a lot of introductory stuff, and the uh, letters to the seven churches and the particular grievances and praises that Jesus has for them. But then once that's out of the way, then John is called up in chapter 4 to, um, to see the, the heavenly vista in an apocalyptic way, and the word apocalypse just means revelation, that's why the book is called that. Uh, so he just sees this this revealed image of this splendorous and magnificent spectacle uh, with a lot of vivid imagery and metaphor just floating all around. And he transcribes what he sees as Jesus told him to do in the opening chapters of the book and the beginning of this chapter or chapter four as well. So among the things he saw was, was the throne of God in the middle and he describes it in various ways and then he describes four angelic beasts for angels that have beastly characteristics uh, or physical, visual characteristics that, in my interpretation, um, convey an idea about who Jesus is as a man, a sacrificed man, as an um, omnipotent man, as an omniscient man, an omniscient, sacrificed, omnipotent man. Those are the four beasts. So that's pretty much all we saw in chapter 4, and that's just kind of the introduction to the scene but then really it picks up now as we open to chapter 5, because now we're going to get the chapter, that chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, which kind of set us on the path to what is this book really about? What are we trying to learn here? It's not enough just for John to describe all these great things and these great images and to be wowed by the heavenly splendor. That doesn't do much more than just scratch the itch and give us a, a glimpse of glory to come. These are people this book is being written to who are hurting and who are suffering and who need more than just, boy, it sure is great over there. Okay, but what am I supposed to do with that? What is the point you're trying to convey to me? And the point of revelation, among other things, is Jesus can save you. Jesus has saved you. Jesus will save you. One, in an earthly sense here on this earth, you're saved, but then in the final eventual post-judgment sense, he will save you. And that assurance comes as we go through this book, among other things. This book has a lot to say. So keep that in mind as we read chapter 5 and study it. The point of this chapter is to explain how Jesus is worthy. He is the one and only one worthy to be our deliverer and avenger. Revelation 5 verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a, the King James says, book. Yours might say scroll. That would be better. Written within and on the backside. Sealed with seven seals. If you, um, again, if your Bible says book, like mine does, let's make it scroll, because that's more accurate, because they wouldn't have, they didn't have books with printing presses and spines like that back then. They had scrolls. And the way it 
typically went was you unrolled the long parchment and you wrote on it, or this way, if you're writing in Hebrew, this way Hebrew, or this way Greek. And so you'd write all over it, but you'd only write on the one side. And you'd only write on the one side for one purpose, so that when you rolled it up, the outside, which is not written on, can get dirty and can get scuffed and take some nicks and some damage and it not affect the material that is written on the inside. You don't have to worry about losing a letter because, uh, you know, something scratched the paper there. So they would roll it on, keep the letters on the inside, and they would tie it with twine. And uh, after it was tied and secure, then if there was an official letter by an official kind of uh, highfalutin person, they would take a dollop of wax and they would impress upon it a signet, a seal, sometimes in a ring, or sometimes it's like a stamp, that bore the crest of the one who had transcribed the letter and who was sending the letter off. So that that letter being known to go to this, whoever the person is, when they receive the letter, if they see the seal has been broken, then they'll know, hey, this letter has been read, this letter has been tampered with, it's only supposed to be private correspondence between him or her and me. But the seal's been broken, so that's no good. The seal signifies the authority of the one who wrote the letter. And it signifies that the letter is special enough that it's not supposed to be read by just anybody. It's supposed to be read by the one to whom it was specifically sent. Here we have a scroll. But this scroll is different in a few different ways. It's written not on just the inside, but on the outside as well. The King James says, within and on the back side, on the front and on the back. So that could be interpreted in a couple of different ways. Maybe it means, since the reason we don't write on the back of scrolls is because the environment is hazardous, maybe it's an implication the environment here, the heavenly environment, is just not hazardous. That's fine. But I think is every single inch of paper has been used. Every bit of the parchment has been used with the writing. The, the writing has been done all over the one side and then all over the back side. In other words, it's finished. It's done. Nothing can be amended. Nothing can be added to or taken away. It is finished and complete. It is a done document. That makes sense? So whatever this is, I, as we go forward, I think it makes sense to see that this is a complete testimony. That what it has to say is finished. It's decided, and you can't change it. And what we'll see, spoiler, as we go through this, what this scroll contains, metaphorically speaking, is the promise of God's vengeance against your enemies, and the promise of God's relief for you. In one way or another, that's what's on this scroll. And it is sealed, as all official documents are, with a seal, with a signet, with the crest of the one who wrote it. Now, who wrote it? It doesn't come out and flat out tell us, but you have a pretty good implication since it's being held by the one who sits on the throne in his right hand, and he's not going to open it. Now, if these things are only supposed to be held by two people, the one who wrote it and the one who receives it, Somebody's holding it. Did he write it or did he receive it? Well, if he doesn't open it, by implication, I assume, he wrote it. If he's not opening it, he wrote it. So who wrote the scroll of God's protection and judgment? Is God himself, the one sitting on the throne. He seals it, however, not just with one dollop of wax and his crest, but with seven. A number we've already discovered in this book, very simply, and I think makes sense to interpret as a number of totality and completion. And even though I say, and I'll say it again, the number seven is no number in Revelation is literal. Don't take any of the numbers literally. There are a couple of occasions where you're it's supposed to, it, it tells you, take this number literally. Like here, where there are seven seals and each one of them is broken, one after the other. So you can literally count, okay, if John is looking at a scroll that is sealed, he is literally seeing seven seals. So it's a literal number, but it carries a figurative meaning. Seven meaning, in this case, totality. The total document sealed with the totality of the authority of the one who wrote it. If the seal represents the authority of the one who wrote it, this represents the total authority of God to write it. And by extension, the sheer lack of authority for anyone to open it, which becomes the theme of this book, of this chapter, the conflict of this chapter which is John's lamentation that nobody seems capable, not because they can't physically do it, but they're not worthy to open it. Um, just one more thing. It was a couple of weeks ago Alex mentioned not just the throne room scene in Isaiah chapter 6, but also it's in Ezekiel, and I made a snide comment. I said he's not allowed in class, and so you don't see him here. Um, but it's actually Ezekiel chapter 2 uh, where that other reference is made. And it just so happens that in that reference is a reference in Ezekiel 2, to a scroll written on both sides. 
Once again, the best commentary of the book of Revelation is the 65 books that preceded it. Um, so you have this scroll that is sealed, and now it's time to open the seals. But we have a problem. Look at verse 2. I saw a, my Bible says, strong angel. What does your Bible say? Mighty angel, same idea, okay. Strong angel, proclaiming with a loud voice, quote, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Who is worthy? Who has the right? So it's not a matter of strength. Who could possibly open this thing? It's not about physical exertion. And yet, it's interesting, you have a mighty angel asking this. Well, I don't read this as an angel with muscles. I read this as a powerful angel. Maybe an archangel. I'm not described that way. It doesn't use the word archangel, but that, that's just what I think of. So you have this archangel, I think. And this archangel doesn't even try. Instead, proclaims, heralds, yells out, as the job of an angel is, and says, who is worthy? Who has the right to receive this correspondence and to open it for all of us to experience what's inside? On behalf of, as we'll see in a minute, all the people People, not angels, but people in heaven, and all the people on earth, and all the people under the earth. So all the people alive and dead. Who has the right to read this message to them? Who has the right? Well, as we'll see, nobody. Verse 3. No ordinary body. Verse 3. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the book, neither even to look thereon. You don't have the right to break the seal. You don't have the right to open the scroll. You don't even have the right to peek. You know, it's rolled up like this and to look in there and kind of see. I think I see an A. You don't have the right even to look at this scroll. You don't have the right to see what has been sealed because you don't have the right to unseal it. Now, there's three descriptions here. No man in heaven. John and the angels surrounding the throne. Oh, not angels, sorry. The elders surrounding the throne. The 24 elders we talked about in chapter 4. They don't have the right. No man still living on earth, being persecuted, pleading, as we'll see later, how long, God, until you avenge us. They don't have the right to open this. Though, spoiler alert again, what's in that scroll is their, uh, their uh, protection from God and the vengeance that they seek on their behalf. But they don't have the right to open it. And no one who is under the earth, no one who has died, has the right either. Now, you might scratch your head and you might say, well, you have the people in heaven, you have the people on earth. And who are the people that died? Aren't they the people in heaven? This is, this is a play, okay? People are acting up parts for a bigger picture. No one has the right to see what it is. And that causes verse 4, John to weep. And I, the writer says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book nor look thereon. You ever been watching a scary movie and you just get overcome with emotion? You say, no, don't go in there because you know the bad guy's in there. Are you watching a stupid romantic comedy and you say, just kiss her already, or whatever. Or you hear your wife yell that because you wouldn't dare watch them. Well, this is what John does, okay? He is watching this play. He's watching this performance, and he's looking around. He's waiting. He's expecting somebody's going to, who's the hero? Somebody's got to be the hero, and he sees all the elders. None of them can open it. He looks down through the, you know, the window of, of heaven to the people of the earth. They can't open it. He looks through that to the grave, to the dead saints, but they can't open it. Nobody can open it, so he just cries out. No one is worthy to open the book. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The divine father wrote the contents of the seal. So therefore, a mere man has no right to touch those divine waxy signets, those wax dollops that have kept that scroll closed. No one has the right to touch them. So who must have the right? There's only one God. He wrote it, so he's not going to open it. A man is not worthy. It must be someone who's not just God and not just man. So who is worthy but the one who is both God and man has the right to be divine and to open a letter of vengeance against man's enemies and protection from God's holy hand. So the elder, again, notice the significance to this. It's not one of the angels who speaks regularly throughout this. Not God, who would have every right to speak, but it's one of the men, 
one of the elders, one of the 24 people who had crowns that they cast down at the throne of God in chapter 4. They're the ones who say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. We've read the script. We know how it ends. Look who has entered stage right. Two descriptions of him. The Lion of Judah. The heir of the home. The firstborn to inherit the, the household after the father dies. The heir of the house. The heir of the family. The heir of the family. Not the heir of the family. The heir of the family was called the lion of the tribe, the lion of the house. He was the one to inherit the pack when all was said and done. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion, the divine inheritor of, but from this human origin, this human birth, this human birthright. Judah, the earthly tribe, the lion of Judah. And he is the heir of all things, Hebrews 1.13, or 1, three. But he's described in a physical, earthly way. The Lion of Judah. Second description, he is called the Root of David. Now you could call him the, um, the promise kept to Abraham. You could connect him to Abraham. You could call him, and I guess the implication by way of Judah, that ties him into Isaac and Jacob and the twelve sons. Um, but that's not what he does. He connects him to David. See, with Abraham, you have a lineage of promise that I will, through your seed, save the world. Through David, you have a lineage of royalty. The one who saves the world is not just a savior, but is a king. He's not just a protector. He's a ruler. He's not just a deliverer. He's a monarch. He comes from David, not just Abraham, who also had Ishmael. Not just uh, Isaac, who also had Esau. But all the way down until you get to David the king, through whom came a, comes a royal seed line, from which comes our Messiah. The connection there uh, to your Old Testament, since we're using that as our commentary, is Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 10. Where Isaiah describes the Messiah to come as the root and the offspring of David, the king who was promised. So the question is, what did Jesus do to be worthy of? to open this scroll. The elder says Jesus prevailed to open the scroll. Prevail implies a battle that has been won. He defeated an enemy. He conquered a foe. So whom did Jesus defeat? What did Jesus defeat? Whom did Jesus conquer? What battle has he already won that gives him the right to open? Because he hasn't opened it yet. He's going to open it in a minute. What the, what the elder is telling John is he has prevailed, and so he can and will in just a moment open. So whom has he prevailed over? Over whom has he prevailed? The devil, sin, death, the grave. He defeated death. He conquered sin. And so by virtue of his perfect life and miraculous resurrection, he has the right to open the scroll of vengeance against those who persecute us and relief from God to his persecuted people. Look at verse 6. And I beheld, John says, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So John is weeping and crying because no one can open. And the elder says, look, the lion is here, the root of David. Okay, the offspring of David, the lion. You hear lion, you look for a lion. That just makes sense. So John turns and he looks and he sees the throne and he sees the four angelic beasts. He sees the elders around. And he's looking for a lion, but he doesn't see a lion. What does he see? He sees the animal opposite of a lion. He sees a lamb. But he doesn't just see a lamb. He sees a lamb standing, though it had been slain. He sees a lamb that looks like it had been killed, but is standing alive and well. Isn't that what your Bible says? There stood a lamb as it had been slain. Is that what your says? Or something like that? This was a lamb that should be on the ground, laying down, bleeding, dead, cold, lifeless, but not. It's standing alive, victorious. This is your champion. This is your lion. A lion has been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. So, to John, a creepy sight. But we know already seven represents something. Having seven horns. An animal with horns is an animal with power. 
That's our puzzle piece. We're going to turn it there and see if it fits as we go through the rest of the book. I think it does. Power. Having seven horns and seven eyes. Eyes represent knowledge. You can see and know things. Having complete power. Having complete knowledge. Kind of like an omnipotent lion, the angelic beast from earlier, and like an omnipotent soaring eagle, the angelic eagle that flew in chapter 4. Again, two representations of what Jesus can do. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. So here is a lamb, innocent, peaceful, small, timid, you might think, um, uh, easily pushed over, you might think, but it's got seven horns. It's got power. It's small and unable to defend itself and know what's going on because lambs are stupid. Oh, this has seven eyes. It knows all things. And what do they represent? The seven spirits. Not seven spirits. I mean, it says seven spirits, but what does seven represent? A total of the spirit. What's going with this lion? What is with oh, this lamb? What is with this lamb? But the Holy Spirit. You have before you in this picture here the whole of Godhead. You have on the throne the Father. You have in front of the throne, not below the throne, not beneath the throne, but present in front of the throne, the Lamb, the Son of God, going with the power of and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. And if that doesn't perfectly describe Jesus, who had the miraculous power of God endowed upon him by the Holy Spirit, and the miraculous knowledge of God endowed upon him by the same, nothing does. That's Jesus. And there he is in front of you, depicted as a lamb who had been slain and got up. Verse 7. And he came and took, he, this lamb, is a he with hands to take. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Seems like a nothing verse. We can move on and keep reading. But I'm curious if your Bible does this, because mine is kind of vague. The original language, the, the, uh, the tense, it goes back and forth. Okay? Jesus came, erkomai, past tense, and took, lambano, present perfect tense. Literally, what John says is, he came, so he's no longer coming, he's already done come. He came. He walked and he stopped walking. He's there. And then took and kept taking. That doesn't make any sense unless you think about it like this. He did a thing and now he's doing another thing and he's going to keep doing it. He did one thing one time. He came, stepped up to the plate and he keeps hitting home runs. He stepped up to the plate and he keeps taking. How is he, he only have one scroll with seven seals. How does he keep taking it? How does he keep taking it? Well, because what these scrolls that we're going to see represent is the judgment of God against his enemies and the protection of God to his saints. He's going to keep bringing judgment. He's going to keep protecting his saints. That, that's, what, that's what present perfect tense is. It's an action that reverberates. Watch me. Watch me. Do it. Everybody do it. It's fun. Ready? On the count of three? Three. Okay, you got to do it hard, though. you got to really slap your hands. One more time. Three. You feel the sting? The sound is gone, but the sting remains. That's, that's present perfect tense. It's already been done, but there's a lingering after effect. Okay? He has died on the cross and resurrected. The slap is done. The after effect is going to be felt by the enemies of God and the people too. Verse number 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps, suddenly harps, and golden vials of odors or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. With the last phrase, there is a clue that these are metaphors meant to convey an idea. Symbols meant to project a thought. So what do we see here? As soon as he takes it, he hasn't opened the scroll yet. Just by taking it, by signifying to all watching that I have the authority and I'm going to use it, everybody says it's time to have a celebration. Everybody says it's time to praise. When they played the Psalms, when they recited the Psalms and learned the Psalms and just recited the Psalms as I said, in the Old Testament, it was common to do so to the tune that was played with a harp. It was done with a harp accompaniment. So what do we see here? Harps are here because we're about to have an Old Testament praise. And golden vials of odors or incense. It's about time for us to have a, a special um, a prayer service in homage to this one who is now worthy, as we're going to see in just a minute. I'm going to praise him. So, and it tells you right there at the end of the verse, the uh, incense is the prayers of the saints. And so he's worthy, and because he's worthy, we're going to praise him. Everybody get your harps. Everybody get your incense, which makes it so funny when people say they played an instrument in, the, uh, in heaven in Revelation. Therefore, we can play uh, an instrument when we worship. But none of you all have odors, except it's that kind of odor. So, no, that doesn't apply. That's not how that works. Verse number 9. They're all ready, and in heaven they sang the new song. Sang. Here's the lyrics. 
Thou art worthy to take the scroll. That's why they're doing this. And to open the seals thereof. For you were slain, this lamb, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Because the lamb can and because the lamb will avenge and protect this heavenly audience, specifically the elders, sing a song to commemorate his worthiness. It's called here the new song. I don't know if the new song is in our songbooks. It's like three pages long, and it goes in like 15 different octaves. It's an, it's an absolute beast uh, to sing. It's the fifth beast is the new song. It's a monster to sing. It's a crazy wild song, but it's got a beautiful, if you just read the lyrics, it's beautiful. But it implies in the song that it's a song we'll sing later. The new song is the song of salvation. That's why it's called the song of Moses and the Lamb. Moses, the Old Testament deliverance. The Lamb, New Testament deliverance. I mean, you can make the lamb the Passover, but Jesus is our Passover. It's the song of God delivering his people, God saving his people. God, as the verse says, redeeming his people by the blood of the lamb. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb, the song. That's the new song. What does it say? You are worthy, worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer, worthy of riches, honor, and power, something like that. That's the new song. Whenever you sing those songs that bring homage to God or Jesus Christ in particular for his worthiness and for what he's done for you, that's what they were singing here. They were just doing it here in the play of Revelation like the old ancients of the Old Testament would do when they sing their songs to God. And they keep singing. Verse 10. And you have made us unto our God. You have made us kings and priests. Now, we all agree we're priests. That's, we don't have a problem with that. First Peter 2.9, we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation of, individual, of, of interesting people, set-apart people. First Peter 2.9, we're priests. But two weeks ago, I made the point, because we got to the part where Jesus said to those churches, if you stay faithful, you'll be redeemed, and I'll make you rulers. And people get all sketchy about that. Oh, I don't think we should be rulers. I don't think we should be kings. God's the king. I don't, I'm not going to be a king. They said, you have made us kings. Now, we're not the capital K, overall, big throne in the middle king, but he has made us to be lesser rulers. He has made us to be kings. Why? Because Jesus is the king and we are co-heirs with Christ, Romans chapter 8. So whatever he gets, we get to receive with him. That's the point of the book. That's the point of salvation. He got it. He was suffered. He died. He rose. He's a victor. You will suffer. You'll die. You'll rise a victor. What did he experience? You'll experience it too. But it's only because he experienced it that makes him one level above you. He has made us kings and priests. When you conquer your enemy, you put your foot on their throat. And you conquer them. You don't capitulate. You don't strike a deal. You don't make a treaty. You conquer them. God is saying to his people, you will conquer those who you think are conquering you. Rome, in this context. Verse 11. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. I saw, he tries to count, well, it looks like 10,000 of 10,000 and just thousands of thousands. It's an innumerable number. He sees the whole heavenly host. The only other time in the New Testament where you get a reference like this is Luke chapter 2, when the, the uh, wise men are coming to uh, when the shepherds, excuse me, when Jesus is born, the shepherds uh, see the, the angels and they're scared. And they say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. The, the, the newborn king has been born. You'll find him in the manger. Uh, and then as, as they say that, there is with them the whole, you heard Linus read it, the whole company of the heavenly host. Well, that's the beginning of the New Testament. When he's born, all of the angelic hosts sing his praise. At the end of the New Testament, as he sits as a, or stands as a victor, and you get to be a victor with him, the same whole company of the angels, every one that God ever made, Sing in unison, verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. Worthy, these angels chant, to receive power. He's worthy for the infinite ability that he has. Worthy to receive riches. He's worthy of the divine abundance that he has. Worthy to receive wisdom. He's worthy for the omniscience that he has. Worthy to receive strength. He's worthy of the power that he has. Worthy to receive honor. Worthy of the great value that he is esteemed to have by God. Worthy to receive glory. Worthy of our exaltation. 
worthy to receive blessing, worthy of the fruit of our lips and the kiss of our lips and our praise to him. Hebrews 13. Who is Jesus? He is powerful, rich, wise, strong, honorable, glorified, blessed. That's Jesus. That's what they sing. But wait. Through Christ, we are co-heirs. We get what he got. We don't deserve it. He did. Because he's worthy, we get the power to overcome evil, the riches of his majesty, the wisdom of his word, the strength to do all things, Philippians 4.13, the honor to be God's children and his brother and sister, the glory of heaven someday, the blessings that come with faithful service, Matthew 5, 3 through 11. He is worthy, inherently. He makes us, maybe not worthy, but he just gives it to us anyway. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, in heaven right now with John watching the play, alive and being persecuted and already dead, and such as are in the sea, that's, Several chapters to come. And all that are in them, I heard saying, quote, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits on his throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. That's another song we sing. Well, we don't sing it much. It's, it's a youth song, which just means the old people haven't learned it yet. Um, be to our God forever and ever, as the song goes. And it's very similar to Psalm 148, where he calls on all of creation to praise the Lord. Skies, mountaintops, hills, plains, angels, men, sun above, ocean beneath, princes, kings, judges, young men, old men, children. That's another song we sing. Oh, how's that one go? Um, well, shoot. You know it. <laughs> Don't you hate when people do that? What's that song? It has the word dragons in it. The kids always love that one. It talks about, you know, it doesn't matter. It's in the book. I promise it is. We sing it all the time. I'll think of it randomly in about seven minutes. Just wait, and I'll just yell it out. Anyway, the contents of the scroll have not even been revealed. We don't even know yet. The point is, though, he's worthy. And just by, being, just by virtue of being worthy, everybody's rejoicing because they already know whatever's in that scroll is good for us. It's bad for our enemies, which is good for us. Because he's worthy, we just need to sit back and just be patient because what's coming is coming. And the four beasts said, amen. That's their call and response. He's worthy to receive all these things and then the four beasts who surround him, which, if I'm right represent what's so special about them, making them very fitting to be the ones to say, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that live forever and ever. Chapter 6. Let them praises give Jehovah. That's it. You know, yeah. She got it. All right. Chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Oh, here we go. No even introduction. It's just time. Let's open. Let's start breaking these open. Seal number one is open. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, what's your Bible say next? At the very end, what does it say? This one says, come and see. Who just says, come? Or come here. Or enter. Something like that. All right. My Bible, the old Bible, says, come and see. Which implies he's talking to John. He's not talking to John. John's already there. He doesn't need to be told to come here. He's already here. But John is watching this, and he sees the lamb, all the people worshiping, and then one of the four beasts, after they say amen, one of those four beasts kind of hovers in front and says, come here. And if I'm John, I'm like, what's about to happen next? Because he opens one of the seals. And so it, it just, I picture it like you're in heaven, and everybody's just leaning in because you've never seen this scroll open before. The seals are sealed, and now one of them is broken. He's worthy. He's breaking them one at a time. And so it's just, you can hear a pin drop, quiet. A seal's broken. And then the first thing you hear is an angel saying, come here. And you're going to look, and you're going to see what is about to happen next. Verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went forth, conquering and conquer. We are being introduced here to the so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse, which sounds terrifying. But if you call them the four horsemen mentioned in Revelation, that's a lot less scary. And that's all that they are. It's the four horsemen and their horses. They're also important because they represent things as well mentioned in chapter 6. 
They are four of the seven seals right here in this text. Seal one is broken. The angel says, you're up first. And up first from stage right enters a rider with a bow and arrow. So that's a skilled rider. This is a precision rider. If you're riding a horse, it takes no effort at all to do this. Are you ready? That's easy. Anybody can do that. That's polo. That's why they, that's why they play polo a long time ago. They, they, that's how you kill people with a sword. Anybody can kill a guy with a sword on a horse. If you can kill a guy with a sword and you can ride a horse, you can do it. But if you want to ride a bow, ride a horse and shoot a bow, that's a lot harder. I'm trying to aim for Jim right now, and it's just not easily done. That takes skill. This guy knows what he's doing. He has practice. He has training. He has experience. He's capable. He is royalty because he has a crown. And he is going forth. Where have you been, rider? Where have you been, horseman? I've been conquering and to conquer. In other words, I've already done a lot of conquering, and I've got more conquering to go. That's what your Bible says. That's what he's been doing. Here is a white horse, white purity. That's been seen throughout this book and will be again. Who are these people with white robes? They're the ones washed in the blood of the Lamb. Pure, white, unstained, unvarnished, clean. So here's a pure horseman going forth having been conquering with more conquering to do. Now your implication or your thought might be to see this as a scary thing. He's a conqueror. He's, a, he's riding a destroyer, a war horse. So he's a, he's a villain. No. He's a rider of the apocalypse. No. This and the other three, the four horsemen, are a representation of Jesus. And I think I can make that point clear. And whom he is conquering is not your enemy. It's you. He has conquered you. And every soul that he's ever saved and ever will save is a soul that he, the commander-in-chief of his army, has conquered. He has defeated that soul that once belonged to the devil. Conquered it to take ownership of it. To own it. You, Christian, are a conquered person. Don't you bow down to him? Don't you call him your king? You're conquered. And here is the conqueror going forth to conquer, to save more people. Keep reading. He opened the second seal. And I heard the second beast, the next one, say, come, you're up next. So if I'm John, I'm watching this. And I see this white rider come in. I don't know where he goes. Because before I can examine him too closely, he says, next. And I look. Verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And they that should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. First one had a bow. Second one has a sword. That's very interesting. Not just the sword, but what he specifically is doing with the sword. What is this rider Riding a red horse, white purity, red conquest, red conflict. This is the color of bloodshed, of, as the verse clearly implies, war. He has come to bring war. He has come, isn't that what you says, to take peace? Is that what your Bible says? He's come to take peace? Well, if you take peace, what's left? What's the absence of peace? Conflict, war. My master, my conqueror, Famously said, I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. To set at variance, the King James says, father against son, mother against daughter, father-in-law against son-in-law, etc., etc. I have come, Jesus says, to make war even within families. <gasps> Jesus, how could you do that? How could you turn me against my son? Well, if you're a Christian and your son refuses to be, you must side with me because I've conquered you. And if he doesn't want to be conquered, if he wants to be my enemy, then he must be your enemy too. Isn't that right? You are on Team Jesus. You are his soldier. And yes, they may be your physical blood. They may be your flesh and blood. But if they're not a Christian... They are not working to get you to heaven. They are working against you going to heaven. They are fighting against you. They are not your ally. They are your enemy by definition, Ephesians chapter 6. So I have come with this, riot, with this horse in red. I have come to bring conflict. Because after you're saved, 
The world pushes back. Conflict comes. You find out, boy, I'm saved. Few are chosen. I'm saved. Few find the way. I'm saved. Many are now my enemy. Conflict. So keep going. What comes after conquest? What comes after conflict? Verse 5. And then he opens the third seal. And I heard the third beast say, Come. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in hand. And let's just keep reading. Verse 6. And I heard a voice say in the midst of the four beasts. Pause. Who's in the midst of the four beasts? If you remember, John sees a throne, which is depicted here like this. And he sees surrounding the throne these angelic creatures, which look like fairies, but that's okay. He sees surrounding the throne these four beasts. Well, here he says a voice coming from what is in the middle of the four beasts. So who is the one speaking here? God on his throne. And I hear the voice say, quote, and your translation may vary slightly, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that thou hurt not the oil and wine. I am conquered, the white horse signifies. After that comes conflict. And after conflict comes suffering. Because we're at war now. And my enemy is ruthless. My enemy is aggressive. My enemy is unyielding. At least until the final day. And then he has to yield. But until then, he's going to make my life hard. Who is he writing this book to? Not just Laodicea, not just Ephesus, not just Thyatira. He's writing this to Christians who are at war and who are dying, who are being made to suffer under the might of the Roman Empire. Did you know in the Roman Empire, if you wanted to buy or sell anything in the marketplace, you had to have a piece of paper that said you swore fealty to Caesar? And did you know when Caesar Domitian took power, he made sure that you understood swearing fealty to me means you recognize me as God on earth? And did you know if you were a good Christian, which all of us should be, you would say, I cannot say that because there is only one God and he's not Domitian, and therefore you do not get the piece of paper that says you can buy or sell in the marketplace, which means if you go to the marketplace for bread, you will get no bread. If you go to the marketplace for flour, you'll get no flour. You want cookies for dessert, you get no cookies. You want meat for your belly, you get no meat. You get nothing. You suffer. So here comes a rider in black, and he has in his hands balances, scales. Not like lizard scales, scales like Lady Justice has scales, balances. He comes doling out provisions to those who are suffering. He comes saying, a little bit for you, a little bit for you. Spare not this, spare not that, a little bit here, a little bit there. He is coming to provide you with temporary relief as you wait final judgment. But notice the pattern. You're saved. You find out who your enemies are. And they push against you. Well, there's a horseman left. Look at verse number 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come. Verse 8. And I looked, and behold, does everybody's Bible, or I guess I should ask it this way, does any Bibles not say pale? All right. I'm very pale. And the horse kind of looked like me if I had a longer face. But let's keep reading. And I looked and behold, in fact, I'm not that pale. No, I'm not this pale, I should say. Keep going. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And his name that set on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Death and the King James says hell. Your Bible might say grave or Hades, the grave. Death and what follows after death. And what follows that is grief. And power was given unto him over, lordship over, dominion over, ability to punish over the fourth part of the earth. And how does he do that? To kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. You have conquest. You're saved by Jesus. Following that is conflict. The world turns against you. Follows that is the black rider of Equal parts protection by God, taken care of by God as the world makes you suffer and hurt and try this every way to get you to turn away from God. But then what comes after that is a pale horse. What comes to the end of everybody? 
whether you are a Christian or an enemy of Christ, what comes to everybody is the same, death and the grave after death. If I am a Christian, death is a doorway to victory. But if I'm not a Christian, it's a pathway to suffering forevermore. The point is, here is me, conquered, suffered, protected, and eventually victorious. Whereas if I'm the enemy, I start here, and I, I uh, mark my enemy, and I punish him, and then I die. And then it really begins for me. Four writers give you the timeline for a Christian. If I'm a Christian reading this, it's giving me the timeline of my whole Christian experience. Salvation all the way through to victory. He has power, this writer does, to kill with, look at these, this is not randomly chosen things he's killing with. Hunger, oh sorry, sword, to start with sword, hunger, and with death and the beasts of the earth. The Roman Empire, if they wanted to kill you, they took the sword and chopped off your head. The Roman Empire, if they wanted to kill you, they... Hunger is the next one. Threw you outside and let you starve. The Roman Empire, if they wanted to kill you, they would throw you to the lions and let you be eaten, the beasts of the earth. God is going to take the methods of your enemies against you and turn them against them. God is going to make sure those who punished you will be punished and will know what they did and why they're being punished. There are four kinds of death mentioned in this verse. Um, four things that he does. But they all represent the same thing. God's vengeance and God's retribution. And in this, this one pattern of these four angels, or these four uh, horsemen, excuse me, you see God's protection and promise to punishment. And the, the connection to those is the fact that you are a Christian and the rest of the world is not. So kill with sword, war. Kill with hunger, famine, which comes to a nation after war. Kill with death, maybe old age. And kill with the beasts of the earth. The Roman Empire would, would uh, bludgeon you, sew you up inside the carcass of a dead animal, and throw you to uh, wolves to be eaten whole. Not whole, whole, but to be eaten every bit of you. The Roman Empire had no limit to the sadistic ways they found to kill and torture a man. They'd starve you, they'd leave you naked and hungry and desperate, and they'd flog you, and then weak and battered, they'd throw you into the pit for the lions to toy with you like a mouse before they ate you. And Jesus says, everything that they did, I'm going to turn them against you, or turn against them. And against whom specifically? In this one verse, there's a phrase. I don't know if your Bible says it the same way mine does. Mine says, the fourth part of the earth. Is that what yours says? That's the Roman Empire. But I can't tell you why yet. You'll find that out in chapter 9. But that's, that's who he's talking about. These ones who have persecuted you. These ones who have caused you to suffer. And all the ways they've done so, I'm going to turn the tables on them. So, uh, there are different interpretations for the four horsemen. But that's the way I view them. I see it as a... Um, a window into the entire Christian experience. Um, it, it's, just, it's interesting the, the, the way it's patterned out. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to say, the word pale here, literally, which it wouldn't really make sense the way we use the word, but literally it means green. It's in fact the Greek word chloros, from which we get the word Clorox, but that doesn't make sense either because Clorox doesn't bleach things green, it bleaches things white, which is why we think of pasty white guys as pale. But the idea is, if you look at a pasty white guy, if I didn't have hair in my arm, you would see my veins, you know, you can see them in my neck. It's, I'm a freakishly looking thing. But it just the color distortion just doesn't look healthy. It looks sickly. I'm fine. But it, it looks, you know, wrong. That's what this horse looks like. You have a, a, a pure, beautiful white horse striking in this imagery. You have this sleek and shimmering black horse. You have this stunning red horse. And then you have this sickly, just gnarly looking horse. How do you describe it? This colorless horse. This is not colorless. This is colorless. And it signifies death that comes to us all. But for a Christian, that's a doorway to, to um, victory evermore. Well, I'm done. and We have 10 minutes. The class teacher said, I need a whole hour. I don't know why they want to spend a whole hour with those kids. Some of them are mine, but they did. Any comments or questions from the floor? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right. What did I say? Right. That, what, I'll show you in about uh, three chapters that that's the Roman Empire. But So what he's saying is, I'm giving this horseman power over, as we'll see, the Roman Empire. The ones who are causing you to suffer. 
with whom you are at war because I've been conquering, I've conquered you. So I, don't worry. The death that you think is coming for you and probably is, Christian, is also coming for them. But I have given this rider of death and the grave that follows power over the one who seems to be so invincible, who seems to be unconquerable, who thought the Roman Empire is the kingdom of a thousand generations, and it's going to fall very soon, relatively speaking. So yeah, I'll tell you in a little while. That's the Roman Empire. Any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. No, I think um, that's the uh, the red horseman, right? Yeah. yeah. So that that's keep it in the mind of a metaphor, okay? You have war, and what happens in war is there's conflict with people, and someone's got to live and someone's got to die. But in the metaphorical sense of conflict with the world, he's saying this is what war looks like. So you have the red the red horse rider is coming with sword, with conquest, with um, the absence of peace, and what is that? Well, it looks like people killing each other. So it's just kind of a, it's, it's like just visually or, or um, textually describing what war looks like. It looks like people killing each other. So it's just a description for the conflict that the world brings us. Not literal killing, necessarily, but just the, uh, the no longer, the antagonism we have now with the world. I concede. I concede. Not everybody, because I read other commentaries, and I didn't like any of them, that not everybody does this with the four horsemen. And I like a lot of the other interpretations, and I have no problem with them. As I said in class number one, this, this class is not 30 different commentaries' opinions about the Bible, because we'd be here for 16 years. This is my opinion and what the book says, as I take those puzzle pieces and make them try to fit so I can see what they are. Because we're all working without the box as we do this puzzle. So we're just trying to make pieces fit. This is how the pieces fit with me. I see beautiful symmetry between those four angelic beasts, that symbolize uh, aspects of Jesus' humanity and divinity, and these four riders that symbolize Jesus' conquest over you and the protection he gives to you uh, while the world pushes back. That's just me. But you've done your math. We have seven seals, four beasts, four riders. Each beast introduces a rider. I see the symmetry there. Anyway, they four riders. There's still three seals left because we're not done with the chapter or the chapter to come. The rest of chapter 6 and chapter 7, which I hope to cover next week in its entirety, is this. I'll give you this as a teaser, and then I'm really, really going to quit. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later, what? God will cut you down. That's the message to God's enemies, to my enemies, the world. You can run, you can hide, but sooner or later, God will cut you down. That seals 5, 6, and 7. Okay? All right. That's all I have for you guys. Revelation 6, verse 9, we'll start next week. Thanks, y'all.